On December 5th, 2001, 20-year-old Wesley Powell was sitting inside his vehicle at a Wajabo gas station in Birmingham, Alabama. An unknown man walked up to Wesley's car, stood inside the open passenger door, and shot Wesley a few times. Sadly, he succumbed to his injuries the next day in a hospital. The man fled on foot. Witnesses were able to tell the police that the culprit is a young black male. Unfortunately, no one recognized them and there was nothing else for the investigators to go on. Then in early 2022, investigators received valuable information regarding the case, leading them to 46-year-old Ricky Witherspoon. Investigators confirmed that he was responsible. Witherspoon was arrested on August 19, 2022. He is currently being held at a Jefferson County jail without bond. During the news conference held by the Birmingham Police Department to address the arrest, some family members of Wesley's attended and made a brief statement, don't give up because at one time, I really did. After 21 years, I did. To see this come to light and give our family some closure so we can have Christmas dinner like everybody else. Because everybody else was having Christmas dinner and we were burying our son. But the main thing is don't give up. Anna Kane, a 26-year-old resident of Reading, Pennsylvania, in 1988, led a challenging life as a sex worker and drug user while raising three children. On October 23, 1988, her life took a tragic turn when her body was discovered in a wooded area near Reading, with bailing twine around her neck. An investigation revealed she had been strangled elsewhere and dumped in the woods. In February of 1990, approximately 15 months after Anna's demise, the Reading Eagle, a local newspaper, received an anonymous letter from a concerned citizen containing information only the perpetrator would know. The letter writer inadvertently left his DNA when sealing the envelope. Subsequent analysis of Anna's clothing found traces of an unknown male's DNA. However, the Pennsylvania State Police chose not to release the 1990 letter to the newspaper, providing no elaboration on its contents, which included intimate details about the disposal of Anna's body and the arrangement of her clothes. State Police Trooper Daniel Wormer stated that this led investigators to believe the letter's author was the perpetrator. Subsequently, they determined that the male DNA on Anna's clothing matched the DNA on the 1990 letter's envelope, confirming their belief in the letter's author as the perpetrator. Despite having the DNA profile, there was no way to identify the individual as he had never been arrested and his DNA wasn't in the system. Genetic genealogy emerged as a crucial tool in this case. The careful preservation of DNA evidence in 1988 by detectives provided a solid foundation for today's investigators to examine with new technology. Genetic genealogy, which combines DNA evidence and traditional genealogy, has become a valuable tool for law enforcement to solve old crimes. Crime scene DNA can now be uploaded to online services, comparing it to DNA submitted by individuals using genealogy exploration services like 23andMe. In August 2022, Pennsylvania State Police utilized genetic genealogy testing to identify the man responsible for Anna Kane's death, Scott Grimm. Grimm, a local man, passed away in 2018 at age 58. Investigations are ongoing to determine if Grimm knew Anna and authorities are urging anyone with information about their relationship to come forward. During a press conference, Anna's daughter, 43-year-old Tamika Reyes, expressed a mix of emotions upon learning the identity of her mother's assailant. She fondly recalled her mother's vibrant personality, describing her as outgoing, fearless, honest, and caring. Tamika expressed frustration with the media's portrayal of her mother solely as a slain prostitute, emphasizing that Anna was a victim, a mother, and loved. Tamika highlighted the pain of growing up without her mother, asserting that no child should endure such loss. While acknowledging she will never get answers from Grimm, she expressed relief that her family now knows who was responsible. Investigators plan to review other cold cases involving Grimm to assess any potential connections. Heather Hodge, a 22-year-old resident of Rocky Mountain, Virginia in 2012, was a college student and had recently become a mother. She was dating Paul Revens Jordan. Jordan reported Heather missing on April 11, 2012, two days after she had last been seen by her family members. Jordan claimed to have gotten Heather a blizzard at a nearby Dairy Queen around 10.30 p.m. on April 9, 
but she was gone when he got home. Heather's sister had dropped her off at the couple's house around 6.30 a.m. that day after Heather had spent a few days staying with her family. Jordan immediately became a person of interest in Heather's disappearance, especially given his recent arrest less than a week before Heather went missing. Jordan faced misdemeanor charges for an attack on Paula Hodge, Heather's mother, throwing a chair and metal toys at her before chasing her out of the couple's home with a baseball bat. He was convicted in July 2012 and given a one-year suspended sentence. He had a prior conviction in 2007 for contributing to the delinquency of a minor and another arrest in an unrelated incident in July 2017, leading to a guilty plea for abduction by force or intimidation in June 2018, resulting in a 10-year sentence. These events indicated to investigators that Jordan, with a history of violent behavior, was capable of harming Heather. Since then, the investigation has continued, revealing more evidence of Jordan's involvement in Heather's disappearance and presumed demise, although her body has not yet been located. In April 2022, a grand jury indicted 49-year-old Paul Revens Jordan for taking Heather's life and concealing her body. The Franklin County Sheriff's Office expressed gratitude for the dedicated work on the case over the past 10 years, emphasizing that Heather's disappearance has never been considered a cold case. Heather's sister, Crystal Sonder, expressed her unwavering belief in Jordan's guilt, advocating for justice on her sister's behalf over the past decade. No additional information was immediately released regarding the specifics leading to the indictment. Jordan is currently held at Green Rock Correctional Center with his expected release previously scheduled for February 2025. Ginny Child, a 35-year-old resident of Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1993, was a sex worker. On June 13, neighbors from an adjacent unit in Ginny's apartment complex complained of bloody water leaking from her residence. Her lifeless body was discovered in the bathroom shower, having been brutally stabbed 65 times, primarily around her neck and torso area. Investigators found male DNA on Ginny's comforter, room towel, and bathroom sink. However, due to the limited capabilities of DNA technology in 1993, investigators faced challenges in utilizing this evidence. The case presented an exceptionally difficult challenge with few leads and no witnesses. In 2018, officials decided to reopen Ginny's case and a breakthrough occurred in 2019. The DNA from the crime scene was matched to 52-year-old Jerry Westrom through the use of genetic genealogy. Despite not being a previous suspect, Westrom, a married father of two adult children from Asante, located about 40 miles north of Minneapolis, had lived in the Twin Cities area from 1991 to 1993. He had previous contacts with law enforcement, including a 2016 conviction for solicitation. In 2019, investigators trailed Westrom to a hockey game where he ordered a hot dog from a concession stand. A discarded napkin collected from Westrom yielded his DNA matching the DNA found at the crime scene. He was subsequently arrested, denying any contact with Ginny or other women in Minneapolis, claiming ignorance regarding why his DNA was found at the crime scene. In 2022, Westrom's trial commenced, and on August 25, 2022, a Hennepin County jury found 56-year-old Jerry Arnold Westrom guilty of taking the life of Jeannie Child. Westrom is expected to appear for a formal sentencing hearing in the coming weeks, likely resulting in a life sentence. Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman expressed condolences to the victim's family, emphasizing the pursuit of justice for serious crimes, even if it takes years to gather evidence. Ginny's mother, Betty Eichmann, who was present in the courtroom during the guilty verdict, expressed satisfaction in the law finally holding Westrom accountable for his actions. She emphasized Ginny's positive qualities despite her challenges, highlighting her big heart. Claire Gravel, a 20-year-old resident of North Andover, Massachusetts in 1986, was a sophomore at Salem State College. On June 20, 1986, after playing a softball game, Claire celebrated with friends at Major McCleishia's pub. A friend dropped her off at her apartment around 1.30 a.m. the next day, marking the last time Claire was seen alive. Her body was discovered in the woods near Massachusetts Route 128, having been strangled. 
Speculation and rumors circulated in the aftermath and despite the initial efforts of police, the case went cold for over 30 years. Then, on August 24, 2022, Essex County District Attorney Jonathan Blodgett held a press conference to announce a breakthrough. Investigators identified 63-year-old John Carey, currently serving a prison term in the Massachusetts Correctional Institution at Concord for an unrelated 2008 case, as the person responsible for Claire Gravel's death. Details about what led investigators to John Carey have not been disclosed and his photo has not been released yet. D.A. Blodgett mentioned that evidence recovered from Claire's clothing played a crucial role in charging Carey. He assured more transparency in court proceedings, revealing new evidence at Carey's arraignment. Carey had reportedly been a person of interest in the case for an undisclosed period, with no clear motive revealed at the moment. D.A. Blodgett emphasized that every lead in the case had been pursued diligently and that authorities had maintained contact with Claire's surviving sister and father. Robert Gravel, Claire's father, has carried a photo of his daughter in his wallet for 36 years. Blodgett stated that they continuously review cold cases, hoping for breakthroughs with new techniques and fresh perspectives. He acknowledged the enduring desire of victims' families for answers. Cheran Hammock, a 29-year-old resident of Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1996, was a mother of two and pregnant with another child. Cheran, involved in sex work and struggling with drug addiction, faced challenges accessing rehabilitation due to a lack of health insurance. Tragically, her life came to an end on October 3, 1996, in Kent County, Michigan, when she was assaulted, strangled, and her body was discovered rolled up in a blanket on the side of the road by a delivery driver. Cheran's case was one of 12 in the 1990s involving women in and around the Grand Rapids area. Most victims, like Cheran, had addiction issues and were engaged in similar work. A local task force formed in 1996 to investigate these cases, questioning numerous individuals and following leads, but arrests proved elusive for a long time. Finally, in August 2022, 64-year-old Gary Dean Hartman was arrested in connection with Cheran's case. Taken into custody in Mississippi, he awaits extradition to Michigan. Hartman's DNA match that found on Charon's body and the rope used to tie her up. He is also a suspect in a similar case of a woman who disappeared outside of Los Angeles, with her remains later found in Maryland. The same male DNA was identified in both cases through familial DNA testing. Detectives discovered that Hartman, by his own admission, lived and worked near Charon's crime scene and was in Michigan when her life was taken. He was also within 20 miles of Ontario, California, when the other victim's body was found in Maryland. It remains unclear whether investigators suspect Hartman in the cases of the other 11 victims in the Grand Rapids area. Hartman had previously served an 11-year sentence in Michigan for first-degree criminal conduct. Sharon's younger sister, Tina the Young, expressed mixed emotions during a press conference, stating, We got him. Mama, we got justice for her. She acknowledged the delayed justice and hoped her deceased parents could celebrate above. Andrea Sankata, a 52-year-old resident of Arlington County, Virginia in 1998, was a single mother and employed as a librarian. Engaged to James Christopher Johnson, her life took a tragic turn on August 20, 1998, when Johnson discovered her lifeless body in the bedroom closet of their shared apartment. Johnson reported missing coins, bags, and Andrea's hatchback Honda Civic with its keys. No signs of struggle or forced entry were evident, but Johnson mentioned that Andrea had given an old computer to Bobby Joe Leonard, a maintenance worker around the apartment, for weeks before her demise. Initially viewed as a suspect, Leonard was not charged, and the case went cold. In 2013, Andrea's son, Kevin Sinqueda, insisted on reopening the case. In 2018, Leonard informed the police that he had worked on Andrea's computer and received a call from someone identifying as an engineer, purportedly Johnson. According to Leonard, Johnson offered $5,000 to take care of Andrea, providing instructions on the method and ensuring Leonard's discretion. However, the money promised was not found in the closet. In November 2021, both Leonard and Johnson were charged. Leonard, already serving a life sentence for assaulting a 13-year-old girl in 1999, pleaded guilty on July 27, 2022. 
Johnson, under home confinement, denies involvement with his trial schedule for September 12, 2022. Johnson's attorneys assert his innocence, criticizing the reliance on Leonard's testimony. Arlington Police Chief Andy Penn emphasized the ongoing pursuit of justice, stating, The passage of time does not diminish the need for answers and accountability in the senseless crime that took Andrea's life. Andrea's son, Kevin Sincata, expressed surprise at Johnson being a suspect, noting the family's support for him in 1998 when he was first identified. 22-year-old Catherine Blavelt lived in Simpsonville, South Carolina in 2016. She was married to 27-year-old John Tufton Blavelt, who worked as a U.S. Army recruiter in Greenville County. Catherine disappeared from a home on October 25, 2016. The following day, friends found her body in the basement of a house that had been abandoned for more than 20 years. The house was a place where Catherine and her friends used to hang out as children. A post-mortem examination revealed that Catherine had been fatally stabbed with a knife. Less than a month after she was found, Simpsonville police obtained a warrant for John Blavelt's arrest, charging him with taking Catherine's life and possession of a weapon during the crime. But by then, Blavelt had fled the state with his 17-year-old girlfriend, Hannah Thompson, a resident of Fountain in South Carolina. She was reported missing by her parents on November 21, 2016, just three days after police issued a warrant for Blavelt's arrest. Blavelt and Thompson were spotted in Las Cruces, New Mexico, a few days later. After the U.S. Marshals joined the search, they learned that the couple had traveled through Alabama, Texas, and California. In December 2016, Thompson called her parents requesting to return home to South Carolina. She was found safe in Oregon on December 12th, having been abandoned by Blavel. Simpsonville police stated that Blavel was known to live around wooded areas near the Oregon-Washington border. The case was featured on In Pursuit with John Walsh in 2019. On July 22, 2022, the Pacific Northwest Violent Offender Task Force, led by the U.S. Marshals Service, captured Blavelt following a lead received at the Marshals' headquarters earlier in 2022. The nature of the tip was not disclosed, but officials stated Blavelt had been living as Ben Klein when they arrested him without incident. Jackson's sheriff, Nathan Sickler, said, We are glad this offender is in custody and the process can begin to seek justice for the victim and her family. The work of this local violent offender task force is extremely important to the safety of our community and we are proud of their efforts and our continued partnership. Catherine's mother, Patricia Pivers, said, Losing a child is unbearable. We knew John did it, but when he ran, our hearts sunk and then he disappeared off the face of the map. In months turned into years, and now five and a half years later, I mean, you lose hope and you just gotta find something to hold on to. But getting that call yesterday, I'm still shaking. Piper continued, it was the most amazing phone call ever. She also told reporters that Catherine's relationship consisted of intimate partner violence and hoped others could learn from her daughter's story. He or she will beat you one day and then the next day apologize. Don't believe it. Catherine got away from him and moved back home. They're not going to change. They threaten, beat, and hurt you. Get away and stay away. John Blavelt was booked into the Jackson County Jail where he awaits to be taken back to South Carolina to face prosecution. 53-year-old John Stagner lived in Orlando, Florida in 1992. He was a hardworking maintenance employee for Orange County and was residing on the county's maintenance property. During the early morning hours of August 10, 1992, deputies responded to a home on North Forsyth Road after John's wife found his body in bed. Orange County Sheriff John Minna said that John had head and facial trauma. The weapon was found in the room, a walking stick. The sheriff's office suspected John's neighbor, Ronald Cates. He had been a person of interest from the start. Cates reportedly had a drug habit at the time and would often borrow several power tools from John, pawning them to buy drugs. John had confronted him about it and asked him to return the tools. On the day John's life was taken, detectives went to Cates's house to speak with him about the case, but he had his daughter lie and say he wasn't home. Investigators later learned that he was hiding under the home that day. In the next few weeks, they managed to interview Cates a few times, noting a lot of inconsistencies in the timeline he provided and what his family members were saying. 
The case persisted, and in 1995, there was an incident where Cates admitted to his family that he took John's life. However, due to limitations in evidence and technology at the time, there wasn't enough to charge Cates. In 2020, a family member of Cates contacted the Orange County Sheriff's Office about the cold case, expressing genuine concern for the case, even though they were related to the suspect. This was because John had been very supportive of the Cates family, providing them with money and a place to stay when needed. Detectives delved deeper into the case, conducting extensive interviews with Cates' wife and daughter in March 2022. They discovered that Cates was abusive to his family and in April 2022, Cates was in a hospital in North Carolina. There, he confessed to a nurse that he took someone's life in Florida in 1992. The nurse reported this and officers from the Salisbury Police Department in North Carolina responded, obtaining Cates' confession on body camera video. Cates didn't explain the motive during his confession but admitted to hitting John with the stick. Investigators confirmed from Cates' family members that he used a walking stick to get around and that he owned the one found at the crime scene. Detectives had enough evidence at that point to interview Cates again and charge him. Cates was arrested on August 5, 2022 and is being held in a North Carolina jail awaiting extradition to Florida. Orange County Sheriff John Minna stated that the Sheriff's Office started its cold case team in 2020 and since then, the team has solved 13 cases dating back to 1984.S.